welcome to Real Estate Resource. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll know when new videos are available. I really hope you enjoy this one. Okay, so continuing on with the RPA, like I said, my intention is to, is to be done with this today. I'm hoping that that's the case. Um, but I know it's, it is important for you guys to understand. And I think all of your questions are as important. So it's, it's, I like that we're going through this and, and really spending some time and digging in with it. So I'm going to start off where we left last week. I'm going to share my screen right now with you guys. And you should be looking at paragraph seven. That's where we left off last week and let me get uh, the chat and everything up so I can see if you guys have any questions all right here we go all right so last week we finished off with talking about the tenant occupied property and and about the seller in possession and we went through all that and I really stressed to you that you've got to be very 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 careful promising that units are going to be vacant when they are tenant occupied. It's just not a promise that you can make. And I know I stressed that last week, so we won't spend a lot of time on it now, but just know that the, the best chance you have for a buyer that's gonna live in a property to get that property when they purchase it is that they're buying a seller occupied or a vacant home. If there's tenants involved, you can't make any guarantees, okay? So let's look at the condition of the property at the closing. And this is, actually lately has been a very common issue that I've been dealing with. I've had more than, you know, I've had more than a few agents that have had questions about this. So here we go. Unless otherwise agreed. So, and, and, and just, so I want to mention this because you're going to, you see as is there is that's why I don't stress that you guys write as is in your counter offers and why it's a, you know, really is just a waste of time to add the as is because it's already in the purchase agreement and it's right here in paragraph seven B unless otherwise agreed the property shall be delivered as is in its present physical condition as of the date of acceptance so remember that when we do our final walkthrough and at the close of escrow that property is delivered the same way it was the same condition it was the day we wrote the offer or the day the offer got accepted unless we agreed on some kind of repairs or something else that was to be done then those things also need to be completed but it said as is in its present physical condition as of the date of acceptance the property including pool spa landscaping and grounds is to be maintained in substantially the same condition as of the date of acceptance so that means that through the entire escrow period all the way up into close that seller is responsible for making sure the maintenance of the property is done exactly the same way as it was when that offer was accepted okay all debris and personal property not included in the sale shall be removed by close of escrow or at the time of possession delivers or at the time possession is delivered to the buyer if not the same date so everything, all your, all of your personal items, any debris, any trash, any, anything needs to be gone either on the close of escrow or when you deliver possession to the buyer, or if those are the same time, then those are the same time. But what they're saying is, is that if the seller's going to remain in possession after the close of escrow, by the time they move out, they got to have all of their stuff gone. Okay. If items are not removed when possession is delivered to buyer, all items shall be deemed abandoned. Buyer after first delivering to seller written notice to remove the items within three days may pay to have such items removed or disposed of and may bring legal action as per this agreement to receive reasonable costs from the seller. So if your seller does not remove everything by the time they vacate the premises, Whatever they left behind is considered abandoned, which means it's not stolen, it's not damaged, it's nothing. They abandoned it. And if the buyer gives them a written three-day notice, here you go, here, we're in writing, we're telling you, please come remove this stuff or we're going to trash it. If they, tr they can trash it and whatever the costs are to the buyer for, for getting rid of that property they can now legally go after the seller for the cost of any of those damages, okay? So you guys as listing agents have to be really strong with your sellers and say, listen, all this garbage that I see here, it's gotta be gone. Start working on it now. 
Start working on clearing the stuff out now. And if there are things like sheds that are going to be left behind, guess what? That shed is not a fixture unless it is somehow bolted to the ground, which I would say 99.9% .9 of those little sheds that people build in their backyards are not. That's considered a personal item. So if you're leaving that behind, if it's not your intention of your seller to demand, dismantle that and throw it, out, throw it out or move it with them, then you've got to counter that it's remaining behind because if you don't and they leave that shed back there, guess what? Now the seller could be held legally responsible for the cost of getting rid of that shed if the buyer doesn't want it. So you guys have to make sure that those things are clear from the beginning. And if you're a buyer's agent and you have a question about it, say to your buyer, hey, by the way, there's a shed here. Do you, do you want it to stay or do you want me to inquire with the listing agent and the seller if that's going to remain behind or do you guys want it gone? Or if you see a bunch of stuff strewn about the backyard or around the property, you've got to make the effort as buyer's agent to go to the listing and say, hey, is this stuff all going to be gone by the time we close? Because my buyers are not going to be able to deal with it. And if the seller says, no, it's not, then it's now you got to go back to the buyer and say, hey, listen, listen, buyer, this seller is not going to clean up all this garbage that's here, you know, the tires and the old car and whatever else is laying around. They're not going to take care of it. So do you want to continue on and be responsible for that? Okay, you've got to do that. So you've got to have that conversation. You've got to be able to say to them, hey, they're not going to get rid of it. Do you want it that way? You can't wait until you do the walkthrough. You guys have to be you know, conscious of the condition of the property as you go through. Now, if they tell you at the beginning, we're not clearing this stuff up and this is it, when you do your walkthrough, if it's in that same condition, you can't then at the walkthrough say, oh no, they, they, they left all their personal belongings behind, okay? So you guys have to understand that. But all that stuff has to be in writing. Otherwise, if we just go by the default of the contract, it's gotta be clear of personal property and debris, okay? In bold here, Buyer is strongly advised to conduct investigations of the entire property in order to determine its present condition. Seller and agents may not be aware of all defects affecting the property or other factors that buyer considers important. Property improvements may not be built according to code in compliance with current law or have had all required permits issued and or finalized. So what they're doing by putting that in bold is they're saying the same things that we should be saying as buyer's agents to our clients is you have to go get a professional home inspection. And you have to go to the city and check the, the permits, the condition of the property. Is it all legal? Is everything permitted? You're, that's your job. Your due diligence to do that is to go to the city and to, to inquire about these things. Your job is to get a home inspector or any other inspector that you want to come in that's a professional. Now, if, and this happened recently, we had an agent that, that called me and said, they don't want to hire a home inspector. Their you know, brother is a contractor, so he's going to do the inspection for them. I said, if they don't want to hire a home inspector, then the steps that you have to take is you have to get them to, to sign the inspection waiver, of course, because they're not getting a professional home inspection. They're having a friend of theirs look at the property. So they're going to do an inspection waiver. And then you're also going to follow up with that email that says, just a reminder, I know you've signed the inspection waiver, but we had a conversation about how I told you it was important that you hire a professional home inspector because of their knowledge of what they're looking for in a property and the cost of repairs and things like that and you've chosen to not hire a home inspector. You've got to cover yourself. Just because they say, oh, my buddy's a roofer, or my buddy's a contractor or whatever, doesn't mean that they know what they're looking for. And it also doesn't mean that you've protected your client 100%. So you've got to cover yourself, which is, I strongly recommend, just like it says here, buyers strongly advised to conduct investigations of the entire property. I'm strongly advising you that you hire a professional home inspector. Now, don't put things in writing like a licensed home inspector or a certified home inspector because there is no such thing in California. There are professional home inspectors, but they're not certified. There's no certification process in the state of California for home inspectors, okay? Uh, seller remaining in possession at the close of escrow. If seller has the right to remain in possession after close of escrow, pursuant to 3M2 we talked about, the parties are advised to consult with insurance and legal advisors for information about liability and damage or injury to persons of personal real property and to consult with a qualified California real estate attorney where the property is located to determine the ongoing rights and responsibilities of both buyer and seller with regard to each other, including possible tenant rights and what type of written agreement to use to document the relationship between the parties. Buyers advised to consult with buyer's lender about the impact of seller's occupancy 
delinquency on buyer's loan. And we talked about that a little bit at the beginning. The thing is, is that it, in some cities, once the seller's in possession, once a tenant is in possession for a certain period of time, then they assume they inherit all of the tenant's rights that exist in that town, in that in that um, municipality, right, or city or state, whatever it is. However, it's governed. They get those rights. So you've got to be careful when you're negotiating these lengths of deal, like, hey, where they're going to stay in position in 90 days. Well, now they've got tenant rights and maybe some things change about how you have the right to evict them. So you've got to be really careful. Make sure you're consulting the right people to get the right information about what rights they do or don't have. Make sure you talk to your lenders and say, hey, listen, the seller needs to remain in possession for this amount of time. How is that going to affect my loan? And we talked about it a little bit earlier, right, with the FHA stuff, is that if somebody finds out that you're not occupying the property when you're supposed to, they can accelerate that loan on you, and you don't want that. Okay? At close of escrow, seller assigns to buyer any assignable warranty rights for items included in the sale, and seller shall deliver to buyer available copies of any such warranties. Agents cannot and will not determine the assignability of any warranties. So what they're talking about in that case is that if, for example, they bought a new stove or a new dishwasher or whatever, and it's still under warranty, if they have the paperwork with that, they're supposed to share it with you. If it's, if it's past the warranty period, they don't owe you any warranty. And that's what that's referring to. Hey, Seuss, you raised your hand, go ahead. Yes, Kai, how are you? Good. What is the, what is the period of time that FHA allows buyers to go to be to get into their house is it three months no i think i think it's 60 days i think it's 60 okay. days it's, that's the maximum that's the max. all right thanks you're welcome okay let's keep going all right where was i oh, okay so warranties if they have them deliver them if they don't they don't and it's not our job to determine whether or not those items are still under warranty that are transferring over with the property um seller shall on close of escrow unless otherwise agreed and even if seller remains in possession provide keys passwords codes and or means to operate all locks mailboxes security systems alarms home automation systems internet and internet connected devices included in the purchase price garage door openers and all items included in either paragraph 3p or paragraph 9. If the property is a condominium located in a common interest development, seller shall be responsible for securing or providing any such items for association amenities, facilities, and access. Buyer may be required to pay deposit to the homeowners association to obtain keys to accessible HOA facilities. So what they're saying there is this. When we do, let's use a seller license to remain in possession, for example. Unless we agree in there in the SIP to not deliver the keys, there's a box you have to check, to not deliver the keys at close of escrow, you're required at close of escrow to give keys, garage door, everything to the new owner. Now, if you think about it as a tenant, for those of you guys that are landlords that have properties, whether you have a management company or you're doing it on your own, you have copies of keys of everything for your tenants because you have to have access to the property. Same thing for a seller remaining possession after close of escrow, they're supposed to give you keys. Now, I know most of the time we don't do that, right? We don't do it. And I've had instances here where as a listing agent doesn't address that on the SIP that, that's, that the keys and everything won't be delivered until the seller vacates. And then they have an issue because the buyer's agent knows the contract and the buyer and they're saying, hey, you got to give us keys. And they really don't have an argument. So you've got to address that. You've got to give them everything. Now, with HOA stuff, if you have a key to the pool or the or the gym or whatever, you know, facilities are there as part of the HOA, you've got to give your copy of the keys to the buyer. Now, if you've lost them for whatever reason, they did add in here, hey, buyer may have to pay a deposit HOA to get a copy of the new keys. That's it. Okay. So just know anything that you have for the property, anything that you need to access the property, remotes, keys, access codes, whatever have to be given to the buyer at close of escrow, okay? Contingencies and removal of contingencies. This agreement is unless otherwise specified in paragraph 3L or attached contingency removal buyer, CRB form, contingent upon buyer obtaining the loan specified. If contingent, buyer shall act diligently and in good faith to obtain the designated loans. If there is no appraisal contingency, 
or the appraisal contingency has been waived or removed, then failure of the property to appraise at the purchase price does not entitle buyer to exercise the cancellation right pursuant to the loan contingency if buyer is otherwise qualified for the specified loan and buyer is able to satisfy the lender's non-appraisal conditions for closing the loan. It's really important, so you have to understand that. If you think that by removing my appraisal contingency, I still have my loan contingency to back me up. If you qualify for the loan, meaning you have the money, you have the income, you have the credit worthiness, you still qualify other than it didn't appraise, your loan contingency does not protect you. And you've got to understand that when, you, when you're removing your appraisal contingency. Buyer is advised to investigate the insurability of the property as early as possible, especially right now. For us in the state of California, obtaining homeowner's insurance, fire insurance for the properties is a difficult and expensive proposition. That should be one of the very first things that you guys do. Don't wait and rely on the lender to find insurance for your buyer. Start doing the homework immediately. Start doing, find out immediately what's gonna happen because we've had a number, uh, I mean, and a, it's a big number of transactions that either have been delayed or nearly canceled because they could not get insurance in a timely fashion. So remember that when you look at contingencies, the insurability of the property is part of your due diligence, your investigation, it's nothing else. So if you're, wait, if you're waiting till the very end, because it's part of my funding or pre-doc conditions or whatever that we have the insurance, you may be outside of your contingency period and not be able to protect your buyer because they can't get fire insurance. Okay, Melissa first, go ahead. I know with the loan and appraisal contingency, I mm -hmm. know um, maybe like as buyer's agents, sometimes we'll want to use like the appraisal contingency in an incorrect way or vice versa, right? So mm -hmm. as listing agents, I was thinking, is it possible for us to, in a, a counter offer, include a clause that says something like, if for whatever reason you don't, you your lender doesn't qualify anymore, then like your lender says you don't qualify, then you have to try honestly, like with our lender, you know how we get them cross qualified usually. Uh, so you, you can't force them to use your lender in any way, oh, unless okay. they're, unless they're incentivized. Like, so for example, if you wanted to not force somebody cause you can't, but if you mm -hmm. wanted to, to give them a reason to use your lender, as opposed to their lender, you mm -hmm. could say, in the first part of your counter is buyer must cross qualify with, you know, seller's preferred lender within X days of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And if buyer chooses to use seller's lender, seller will pay, you know, $5,000 credit clo closing cost credit, or uh, you could mm -hmm. do something like if buyer chooses to use their own lender and cannot close on time, oh. buyer to pay a $150 a day per diem, you know, for the for any extensions of any contingencies or escrow period, but if they use seller's preferred lender, there will be no uh, per diem charge. Like you could do that, <laughs> but you can't say if you don't qualify, you have to go to our lender. No. Mm, okay. But, but but you can make it a condition that they cross qualify with your lender. That you can do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, Sarah, go ahead. Hi guys, you know, what I wanted to just share real quick is very early on in the, uh, um, when you open escrow, the opening package from escrow does have a page that you have to share with your buyer where it uh, touches on the insurance uh, information. So I kind of make it a rule of thumb very early on when we do the opening package with the escrow that I hand that to them immediately after the, the escrow gets open. It's just kind of like, it's on paper, it, it's, it's kind of like a step to follow. It's worked for me in the past, especially yeah. now that insurance is so difficult. Yeah, I think that I think that that's a it's a it's a good thing to use as a as an indicator. Like, hey, we. But if you're not already having this conversation with your buyers before you're in escrow, you guys are making a mistake. With as difficult as insurance is, when you're doing your buyer consultations prior to showing, you've got to make sure that you're referencing the issues with insurance that we're dealing with right now. Because I don't think, buyers don't get it. And I think sometimes for us as agents, we don't even get it. They're like, yeah, they'll get insurance. Or their thought is, I'll just call my insurance people and they'll do it. And well, we know what, but, you know, there's plenty of insurance companies that don't insure 
in California anymore at all. And then with the fair plan, there's some time that takes to get things done and the cost of insurance. I think so, uh, what an agent mentioned to us yesterday that he's got a, a client in, I don't know where it was. I think it was, I want to say it was Murrieta, but it may not be, but it was $500 a month for their insurance. So again, I think that's a great step, Sarah, that to reminder of, hey, remember what we talked about with the insurance now, see the even escrow is reminding you. But the thing that we have to, uh, we can't rely on escrow because those escrow documents that get signed, they're really not, they're not binding. They don't supersede anything that's in the contract. So we can't always just rely on those. Okay. Oh, I got a text. It was Moreno Valley. There we go. Not Murrieta. So I knew it was an M, Moreno Valley. Okay. So let's see. We got uh, Mireya has a question. What if you have a property with many unworking cars and trash on the property? As a buyer, can you request all that removed sooner or later than later for insurance? You you can. You can request that. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Do they have, are they compelled to do it? No, Mm -mm, that's a problem. So yes, you may have issues with that when there's, you know, considerable debris around. Um, But yeah, you can ask, but there's nothing that obligates them to do that prior to close of escrow. So if it takes them all the way to, you know, you doing your walkthrough, there's nothing you could do to make them do it faster. So, but good point. Yes. Ask. If you see that, ask, please ask. Okay. So you got to make sure that we work on that insurance right away. Okay. Buyers contractual obligations regarding deposit balance, down payment and closing costs are not contingent to the agreement unless other guys otherwise agreed in writing. Um, so just know that that's not a contingency. Just those, the, the, the amount of those is not the contingency. If there is an appraisal contingency, removal of the loan contingency shall not be deemed removal of appraisal contingency. Okay. So it used to be tied together. I think that's why they did that. Um, no loan contingency. If no loan contingency is checked in paragraph 301, obtaining any loan specified is not a contingency of this agreement. If buyer does not obtain the loan specified and as a result is unable to purchase the property, seller may be entitled to buyer's deposit or other legal remedies. Bertha, I saw your hand up. So go ahead. You had a question. Um, regarding to the last question, I Uh do always stay on the contract that all, uh, junk debris or whatever is on the property must be removed prior close of escrow and uh, obviously once we're close to close escrow by the time of the final inspection everybody is motivated to close mm-hmm. so i enforce the listing agent like uh, in a good way but i will not close unless it's everything removed but they usually do it so you know. Yeah, yeah, but I mean and that's that's great that you do that but all of that stuff is already in the contract right we just yes. We just went over the debris and the possession and all. I mean, it's already there. And that's, and I think that sometimes for us, we do more work than is necessary because we don't know this part of the contract. We only know the part that we fill out, right? We only know that part. So it's great that you do that. It doesn't change anything because it's already there. And that's what the final walkthrough is for. And that's, you know, Jesus put that in the chat. That's why your final walkthrough is so important. And when you do your final walkthrough is so important because I, I know that there are people that... I, I had an agent this this week that did it the day that the property recorded and there was a problem. So just again, when you do your final inspection is is as important as doing the final inspection. OK. Um, this agreement appraisal is otherwise this agreement is unless otherwise specified in paragraph 302 or an attached contingency removal form contingent upon a written appraisal of the property by a licensed or certified appraiser. We know that already, right? Appraisals are often a reliable source to verify square square footage of the subject property. However, the ability to cancel based on the measurements provided in appraisal falls within the investigation of property contingency. The appraisal contingency is solely limited to the value determined by the appraisal. For any cancellation based on this appraisal contingency, buyer shall deliver a copy of the written appraisal to seller upon request by seller. So... What they're saying is, is if you get the appraisal back and the appraisal says, oh, the property is 1,300 square feet, but you thought it was 1,500 square feet. If you've already removed your investigation contingency by the time you get that appraisal, you can't cancel because it says that. Because it says that the, the square footage is less. You can't do it. So you've got to make sure that you're investigating all that stuff if that's a concern for you. Now, what it says here is that if you don't, if the property doesn't appraise, 
and you're trying to negotiate or cancel because of the appraisal, you've got to send a copy of the appraisal to the seller. And for some reason, buyers and buyers agents really fight the idea that they got to give the appraisal over. Okay. But what I would do to get rid of that is I would put that as a counter. I would say that, you know, buyer to provide complete property of appraisal at, at you know, to listing to seller, um, regardless, like, I don't care if you cancel or you're renegotiating or if it doesn't appraise, I want a copy of your appraisal. So I'm going to make that part of the contingency. Danny, go ahead. Hi, Kyle. Thank, thank you for taking my, my question. Uh -huh. So what if you're past that point where you cannot put that stipulate that on the counter offer and you're at the point where you're now requesting in writing in the email and a text message, Hey, I need a copy of the, uh, the appraisal report for the seller. And the buyer's agent is just adamant about, no, we cannot, we're not, we're going to do that. What, is there any other remedy or solution that we can have to be able to get those documents or get that report for our clients? But well, it, it's, it's only required unless you counter it for them to give it to you if they're either going to negotiate the price because they didn't appraise or cancel. Okay, so if, if the contract says right here, for any cancellation based on the appraisal, like if that's if they're going to cancel, they have to give it to you. My thing is, is that you got to do your counter. So the only way, the only way that you can compel them to give it to you based on the contract is if it cancels. Right. So if they call you and say, hey, it appraised for, you know, one hundred thousand dollars less than what we offered. We want you to reduce the price. And you say, no, I'm not reducing the price. So they say, OK, we're canceling using our appraisal contingency. The contract compels them to give it to you. Right. They're now in breach of contract. I would threaten that if they try to cancel without giving you the copy that you're going to keep their deposit to force them to to give you the, the, the report. Any other time you can't you, you can't compel them unless you do it in your counter. And, and, OK, so that clarifies. Yeah, it's a situation um, they did not. The value came in at whatever it was, and it was no problem at all with the, the value. But they just wouldn't give uh, the appraisal report to the uh, seller. Yeah, they're not required <clears throat> to in that case. Okay. It's, it's a weird thing. Like, like there's a gray area because there is a section here that says any report that the buyer pays for, they have to give it to the seller, right? Anything that they do, any report that they perform. And I think part of the problem with, I think part of the problem with the appraisal is that sometimes the buyer doesn't pay for it, right? And so do they, do they own it and all those things? But in this case, the contract makes it, hey, if you're canceling because of it, you've got to show proof that it didn't appraise and that's why you're canceling. Any other time we do it, we've got to make that, that effort at the beginning as part of a counter that says, hey, you're going to give us a, a complete copy of your appraisal report. So that's, yeah, unfortunately, uh, okay. no. They're, Got they're, it. Thanks. Not, Thanks. No, yeah, no problem. Uh, usually escrow will ask for appraisal inspection. You want to share it either for credits or to confirm price. Yeah, but whatever escrow asks for is not necessarily for us. It's not, again, we're talking about how the contract is saying what you're required and not required to do. And in that case, the only time they're required to provide that appraisal is if they cancel. Okay. Um, if there is no appraisal contingency checked in paragraph 302, then buyer may not use the loan contingency specified to cancel his agreement. We already talked about that. Okay. The Fair Appraisal Act, that's one of the forms that's attached. We already get it in the, in the um, package. Okay. Investigation of property. This agreement is, as specified in 302, contingent upon buyer's acceptance of the condition of and any other matter affecting the property. See paragraph 12. We'll get to that in a moment. Review of seller's documents. The agreement is specified in paragraph 3L is contingent upon buyer's review and approval of seller's documents required in 14A. We'll get to those. Title, this agreement is as specified in 3L5 is contingent upon buyer's ability to obtain the title policy provided for in paragraph 13G and on buyer's review of current preliminary title report. Okay. So again, we're not going to read all of that. It's just saying, hey, it's again, it's contingent on us getting a prelim from you guys and reviewing that prelim. Okay. Buyer has five days after receipt to review and revi a revised preliminary report, if any, furnished by a title company and cancel the transaction if the revised preliminary report reveals material substantial deviations from the previously provided preliminary report. So let's say you get your prelim at the beginning and somehow something changes and title says, oh, oh, wait, 
There was a change to title. Here's a new prelim. The buyer then, no matter how late it is, has five days from the receipt of that prelim to say, you know what, it's it's changed. There's some other things that are issues. We're going to cancel. So you got to understand that, uh, that that is an option for them. Uh, the can- condominium plan development disclosures, right? The HOA docs. The agreement is specified in paragraph 306 is contingent upon the review of the common interest disclosures required by Civil Code 4525 and under paragraph 11, CI disclosures. We'll get to that. By review of leased or lien items, it's a contingency. We talked about that earlier. The stuff that is leased or leaned items on the property, the buyer has the right to investigate that. They have a contingency to see if they can, if they can qualify, and then they have to remove it if they're going to qualify and take it on. <clears throat> removal or waiver of contingencies with offer. Buyer shall have no obligation to remove a contractual contingency unless seller has provided all required documents, reports, disclosures, and information pertaining that contingency. So when you remove all your contingencies at acceptance, which we've seen those things, I'm not required to do it until you give me everything, okay? If buyer does remove a contingency without first receiving all required information from seller, buyer is relinquishing any contractual rights that apply to that contingency. If buyer removes or waives any contingencies without an adequate understanding of the property's condition or buyer's ability to purchase, buyer is acting against the advice of the agent. So you've gotta be careful when you take that tactic of we're gonna remove everything because even then, whatever, ability you have to cancel and get out of the transaction is gone with the removal of that contingency even though you didn't get disclosures and things like that <clears throat> danny did you have another question or did i forget to lower your hand no 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 i put it up back up oh. so yeah i do so hypothetically now i'm on the side i'm representing a buyer mm-hmm. um and we still have not received the city reports from the city of los angeles 9a report the certificate of compliance uh-huh. So are those included in part of the uh, reports and disclosures? Yes. 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 So they're, then they're part 17, of the seller's documents. So part uh, 17 days gone by, we have to remove our contingencies and we're still not rece- in receipt of those documents. We don't have to remove the contingency for those specific ones. Well, and where are they located? Yeah, yeah. No, you don't have to. Well, I would just on the contingency form, I would just say review of seller's documents. What I would suggest that you do, though, is you ask for an extension. Don't just wait for them to ask you and then say, no, nah, I'm not doing it because you didn't provide it. I would send an email and extension saying, hey, you guys haven't provided us with the 9A report or the certificate or it's the 9A report really is the only thing. You haven't re- yeah. provided us with the 9A report. We're not going to remove our contingency until we have the ability to review that. Okay. And that's it, it. period. That, that's, and then and send the extension of time. And then, you know, you can extend it as you need to. Give me, you know, do a week here, 10 days, whatever it is that you think you're going to need to get that report back. It usually, it shouldn't take that long for the 9A, though. Does that go for the pre-sale inspection report? Corrections? Yeah, yeah. South that Gate, done? Well, no, 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 not the corrections, not the clearance, just the report itself. That's it. The clearance okay. has to get done, but the providing the documents is just the reports themselves. Go ahead, Jesus. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes, I don't really sell that many homes in Los Angeles. What does the A the A report has or shows? Well, the 9A report is just about any substandards or permits that were issued for the property. But the most important thing um, for the 9A report is whether or not the sewer line is permitted, because a lot of the houses in LA they didn't have. Uh, the sewer lines previously so people were just hooking up to the sewers when they went in so some sewer lines are not uh permitted and if they're not it could be costly to get the permits done and make sure that it's done properly right the 90 and the 90 is only for the city of los angeles but Thank yeah you. but pre-sale but pre-sale, inspe- pre-sale inspections in in other cities are also part of that seller documents the the 90 report has a, like like uh, several pages and then the, both buyer and seller have to fill out, or they have to circle little dots and stuff, uh, questions and answers, questions and answers. And then the seller has to um, uh, pay pay some money to have that report generated. Yeah. It's $70.15. It's like yeah. an odd number. But yeah, yeah. The, that's the... Uh, but the, the questions that are answered on there, there are for the certificate of compliance, it's for the low flow water, the earthquake shutoff valve, those things. The the 9A report itself, and it's called something different. Now they changed the name. It's not 9A anymore or something. But it's just a list of any substandards, uh, permits that have been applied for, and whether or not that the, the sewer line is, 
is permitted. That's what that is. The certificate of compliance is the questions that were answered about the structure of the property. Okay, uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, we did the removal of contingencies or cancellation. Oh, for any contingency specified in paragraph 3L8 or elsewhere, buyer shall within the applicable period specified remove the contingency or cancel the agreement. Now, that's what the default is, right? Is you either remove it or you cancel, but we know that in the middle there's negotiations for extensions and things like that. For the contingency for review of seller's documents, preliminary report and condominium plan development disclosures, buyers shall within the time specified in paragraph 3L or five days after delivery of seller documents or CA disclosures, whichever occurs later, remove the applicable contingencies in writing or cancel this agreement, what we just talked about, right? If buyer does not remove a contingency within the time specified, seller after first giving buyer notice to buyer to perform, CA or form NBP shall have the right to cancel this agreement. Sale of buyer's property, this agreement and buyer are his ability to obtain financing are not contingent upon the sale of any property owned by buyer unless the sale of buyer's property, CA or form COP, is checked as a contingency of this agreement in paragraph 3L8. Okay, then items uh, included and excluded. Items listed as included. It's just talking about that paragraph 3P where we went through what's included. All of those are going to be transferred without warranty unless a warranty still exists on that property. The items included, all existing fixtures and fittings that are attached to the property are included in the sale. Exist, and this is where they're going to list the stuff that looks that is fixtures, what they consider. Existing electrical, mechanical, lighting, plumbing, heating fixtures, ceiling fans, fireplace inserts, gas logs and grates, solar power systems, built-in appliances, and appliances for which special openings or encasements have been made. So, like, you know, most people have a stove that is personal item, right? They're just the countertops in, you put the stove in, right? It has the burners on top, has the oven on the bottom. Those are personal items. Those don't always have to stay. But, for example, if somebody built the cabinets specific to that stove, because of the size of the stove or a refrigerator. You've seen those refrigerators in nice houses where the front of the refrigerator looks just like the cabinets and the space that it was built was built specific for that refrigerator. Those those kind of items may have to remain even if they're not built in, okay? But built-ins have to stay. Windows and door screens, awnings, shutters, window coverings, which includes blinds, curtains, drapery, shutters, or any other material that cover any portion of the window, and any associated hardware and rods, they have to stay. So it used to be like that wasn't kind of covered. Like, well, what is it? Is it is it the curtain rods that have to stay? Is it now they're making it clear it's anything. Anything that covers the window, attached to the window, it stays. So if you have custom drapes, those custom drapes stay. If you have blinds that you love, those blinds stay unless you specifically exclude them in the contract, okay? Attached floor coverings, television antennas, satellite dishes, dishes air coolers and conditions, conditioners, pool spa equipment, including but not limited, limited to any cleaning equipment, such as motorized automatic pool cleaners, pool heaters, pool nets, pool covers, everything that goes to the pool has to stay. Garage door openers, remote controls, mailbox, in-ground landscaping, water features and fountains, water softeners, water purifiers, light bulbs, including smart light bulbs, and all items specified as included in paragraph 3P, 3P if currently existing in the time of acceptance. That's it. So if there's a list of all the stuff that has to stay and you've got to have those conversations with buyer and seller to be like, hey, seller, this has to stay. Hey, buyer, this is this is supposed to stay, but they're asking for it to leave like you have to. OK, uh, <laughs> Jesus is doing a commercial saying leave the blinds and get some new ones for me. Sure. Do that. Do that. OK, if seller does not intend to include any item specified as being included above but it is not owned by seller, whether placed on the property by agent stage or other third party, the item should be listed as being excluded, okay? Security system includes any devices, hardware, software, or control units used to monitor and secure the property, included but not limited to any motion detectors, door and window alarms, and any other equipment utilized for such purpose. If, if checked in paragraph 3P, all such items are included in the sale, whether hardwired or not. Smart home features includes any electronic devices and features including but not limited to thermostat controls, kitchen appliances not otherwise excluded, and lighting systems that are connected hardwired or wirelessly to control a unit 
computer, tablet, phone, or other smart device, any smart home devices and features that are physically affixed to the real property and also existing light bulbs are included in the sale. Buyer's advised to use paragraph 3P1 or addendum to address more directly specific items to be included. Seller advised to use a counter offer to address more directly any items to be excluded. Non-dedicated devices. If checked in 3P, all smart home and security system control devices are included in the sale except for any non-dedicated personal computer, tablet, or phone used to control such features. Buyer acknowledges that a separate device and access for Wi-Fi or Internet may be required to operate some smart home features, and buyer may have to obtain such devices after close of escrow. Seller shall delist any devices from any personal accounts and shall cooperate with any transfer services to buyer. Buyer is advised to change all passwords and ensure the security of of any smart home features. So what they're saying is like, you know, some people have an Alexa that they, you know, the, the Amazon Echo, right? Where they'll say, you know, turn on the lights with it or change the thermostat or whatever. That Alexa, that Echo is not a dedicated item to the smart home. It works in concert with, but it is not dedicated, which means I get to take it. But some smart homes have a system that comes with a tablet that is specific to that, that has to remain. But if I control it with my computer or with my iPad or with my Echo or whatever, my Google Voice, whatever it is, if I run it with any of those products, those are my personal products, I get to take them. I've got to disconnect the accounts from all of the smart home features, but I get to take that. But if I have something that is specifically only for running that smart home feature, I've got to leave it behind. Seller within time specified in paragraph 3 and 1 shall disclose to buyer if any item or system specified in 3P or 9B or otherwise included in the sale is leased or not owned by seller or is subject to any maintenance or, on, un, or other ongoing financial obligation or specifically subject to a lien or other encumbrance on the loan and deliver to buyer all written materials such as lease, warranty, financing, etc. concerning any such item. Seller represents that all items included in the purchase price unless otherwise agreed are owned by seller and shall be transferred. Oh, I switched to the next one. Okay, so this is lease turn lien items. Solar panels, water softeners, home security systems, whatever it is. If there's still a payment that needs to be done or a license, like a, a monitoring fee or some kind of maintenance fee, that's got to be disclosed. It becomes part of the contingency for the buyer, whether they want to accept that or not. Uh, the items that are, are transferring, I own them. Okay, that's it. And I'm transferring them without any warranty. Seller should co cooperate with the identification of any software applications and buyer's efforts to transfer any services needed to operate any smart home features or other items included in this agreement, including but not limited to utilities, security systems. So what they're saying is you got to help the buyer out. You can't just say, there it is, have it, go figure out where to go. No, you got to give them like, here's where you go to change your account. Here's where you go. You got to kind of help them through this, okay? The items excluded, unless otherwise agreed, the following items are excluded from the sale. All items specified in paragraph 3P2, audio and video components such as flat screen TVs, speakers, and other items. If any such item is not itself attached to the property, even if a bracket or other mechanism attached to the component or item is attached to the property, furniture and other items secured to the, prop to the property for earthquake or safety purposes, unless otherwise specified in 3P1, brackets attached to walls, floors, or ceilings for any such component, furniture, or item will be removed and holes or other damage shall be repaired but not painted. So what they're saying is, is that all everybody now has their flat screen televisions, not everybody, most people have them mounted to the wall in some fashion, right? Or they have surround sound speakers that may be mounted to the wall, but because that item itself is not physically mounted to the property, it's personal property. And the brackets that mount it are also considered personal property. So I get to take all of that as seller. The thing is, is I gotta patch the holes. I don't have to paint the house, but I have to patch the holes. That is the only thing I'm required to do, okay? Allocation of costs. Oh, let me, any questions about the items included or excluded? Any questions? Yes, Darwin. Hey, boss. This happened yeah. to me uh, a closing um, two months ago uh -huh. that um, it, it is frustrating because I, I get what you're saying that um, I was representing the buyer. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I was an agent from my office that we yeah. proved them. After we closed, we gave them 10 days to stay to the seller. And then uh, they removed the fence, which was wood, wood in the fence. They removed it. They took lamps. They were attached to the house. 
They even took the heads of the shower. So just to give you an example, mm -hmm. it's frustrated because you gave them. I, the good thing that I, we took pictures before when mm -hmm. I showed the house, I took pictures and everything that came out there. Mm -hmm. So I just share that. It's frustrated that, that, that uh, they took that. Yeah. And, and in this case, buyer has to take it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the seller ultimately is responsible civilly for that. It's up to the buyer if they want to go through that and go through the civil process. But it happens a lot, guys. It happens a lot. Sellers take stuff. When I was an agent, it happened to me. I had to pay for a microwave, a built-in microwave, because my sellers took it and they moved to Brazil and I had no way to go after them. So instead of having to put up with the argument from the buyer's agent and the buyers, I just gave them the money to buy a microwave. It happens. It happens. Okay. Inspections, reports, tests, and certificates. Paragraph 3Q1, 2, 3, and 5 only determines who is to pay for the inspection report, the test or the certificate or the service. It does not determine who is to pay for any work recommended or identified in any such document. Agreements for payment of required work should be specified elsewhere in paragraph 3Q or 3R or in a separate agreement such as the CAR forms for the request for repairs, the seller's response to the request for repairs, an addendum, or an amendment of existing agreement terms. Any reports on these paragraphs shall be delivered in the time specified in 3 and 1, which was seven days from the seller, right? So any of those reports that were required have to get, pro get provided from the seller to the buyer in that period, in seven days. Government requirements and corrective or remedial actions. Legally required installation and property improvements. Any required installation of smoke alarm or carbon monoxide devices or securing of the water heater shall be completed within the time specified in paragraph 3N4 and paid by the party specified in paragraph 3Q4. If buyer is to pay for these items, buyers instructed by escrow holder shall deposit funds into escrow or directly to the vendor completing the repair installation prior to close of escrow. Seller shall deliver to buyer written statements of compliance in accordance with any law unless seller is exempt. If seller is to pay for these items and does not fulfill seller's obligations in the time specified and buyer incurs costs to comply with the lender's requirements concerning those items, seller, seller shall be responsible for buyer's costs. Now this part about buyer paying for it and putting the funds into escrow. Yes, you're going to put the funds in escrow, but you can make it part of the closing costs. So they put it with their closing funds, those kind of things, as long as the people doing the work don't mind getting paid by escrow. If they want to get paid ahead of time, then you've got to put the, the money in and, and then get paid. Point of sale requirements. Point of sale inspections, that's the pre-sale inspections from the cities. Reports are refer, refer to any such actions required to be completed before or after close of escrow and that are required in order to close under the law and paid by the party specified in paragraphs 3Q5 and 3Q6. Unless parties otherwise agree to another time period, any such repair shall be completed prior to final verification of property. We do that. We agree to do it after the close of escrow for sometimes for the city pre-sale when the buyer takes it on. Okay. If buyer agrees to pay for any portion of such a repair, buyer shall directly pay to the vendor completing the repair or provide an invoice to escrow holder, deposit funds into escrow sufficient to pay for the buyer's portion of such repair and request escrow holder to pay the vendor completing the repair. Buyer shall be provided within time specified in three and one, seven days, unless parties otherwise agree to another time period, a copy of any required government conducted or point of sale inspection reports prepared pursuant to this agreement or in anticipation of the sale of property. Any reinspection fee. So that's just the details, right? The pre-sale inspections, they got to get done in this period of time, and that's it. That's how it works. Reinspection fees. So reinspection fees, what we're talking about is like mostly for the appraisal, right? When there's a, like something has to be fixed because of the appraisal and it has to get done. If any repair in paragraph 10B1 is not completed, and we're, we talked about 10B1 right here, the legally required stuff, the water heater, the smoke detector, the, the, the carbon monoxide. If any repair in 10B1 is not completed when the time specified and the lender requires an additional inspection to be made, seller shall be responsible for any corresponding reinspection fee. If buyer incurs costs to comply with lender requirements concerning those items, seller shall be responsible for those costs. So you got to tell your sellers, hey, by the way, here's what happens. If you don't do this, you're going to have to pay for a reinspection fee if there is one. And if it costs the buyer something, you may have to pay those costs. So the time period is seven days for all those things to be done. The, the carbon monoxide installation, 
the water heater strapping, the smoke detector installation. If you're making the buyer pay for that, obviously that's going to get paid through escrow. They, however, they're going to do that. But the report, the repairs themselves still need to be done the first seven days. So if you can't get them done in seven days, then you need to counter back the time period so that your seller can avoid having those reinspection fees. Information. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Hi, guys. Again, so what I've done when I walk the property with the buyers for the first time. I'm, I'm looking at it from the lender's perspective as well, because you we know what's going to fly with the fun uh, with the funding, you know, with the financing. So mm-hmm. I kind of pointed out at that point, And when I submit my offer, I bring it up to the listing and the sellers at that point as well. Like make sure that those things are in place. And, you know, that would avoid the reinspection fee altogether. I mean, yeah, that's true, but you got to be careful because you never know what's going to be called. You, like it could go the opposite direction for you. We had an agent here that told somebody because the seller had agreed to do any lender required repairs, right? So the lender said, we'll do anything that the lender requires, right? So the agent took the buyer to do their inspection and they saw that there was peeling paint and some other things. And they said, oh, this is FHA. The lender's going to, you know, the appraiser is going to call that. So don't ask for it in your request for repairs. Guess what happened? Wasn't in the appraisal. So now that they didn't get repaired and the buyer was not happy with the agent. So, I, I mean, we yes, we have an idea of what appraisers are going to call and not call. And it's fine that we could say to a, a listing agent, hey, by the way, you know, this is FHA. You guys accepted FHA. This probably needs to be repaired because FHA is going to call it. And then you guys will have to do the reinspection. But the reinspection is not because the the screens are ripped or because the, the paint is chipped and that needs to be repaired. It's for the legally required things which is just the water heater smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors that's it that's the only thing that if there's a reinspection because of those the seller is required to pay for so yes it's good for us to do that but i mean do you we don't know if i look at a water heater i don't know if it's legally strapped or not i'm not a i'm not that's not my job i don't know i don't know if the smoke detectors are in the right place or not I don't know if the carbon monoxide detectors are in the right place. I don't know that. I can see that they exist. So we just have to be careful about what we what we share and don't share. Go ahead, Danny. Hey, Kyle. So heads up, everyone. I've had a few transactions where we're presenting buyers, and they use FHA loans. And the, the appraisers are not calling things that they used to call back then. Um, example, there was one uh, window that was broken. The appraiser never called it out. That for me is a biggie thing. Um, a smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detector. They didn't call them out for whatever mm-hmm. reason. And that's weird, right? Yeah. Um, they only called out the chipping paint around the, the eaves of the property. And I'm like, mm-hmm. what's going on here? Um, so I just want to give everybody a heads up. Yeah, and that's why that's why what I said earlier was don't rely on, well, the lender's going to require it. So the sellers usually do lender required repairs because we don't know what an appraiser is going to call and not call. We can't guarantee it. So we have to be really careful with that. So it's good to have the conversation with them about the cut types of things that an appraiser may call for a, you know, a lender required repair, but, but we can't be super certain about it because we don't know. Okay. Um, information and advice on requirements, buyer and seller shall advise to seek information from a knowledgeable source regarding local and state mandates and whether they are point of sale requirements or requirements of ownership. Agents do not have expertise in that area. Again, what I just said, be careful. Um, home warranty, the buyer shall choose the home warranty plan and any optional coverages. Buyer shall pay any cost of that plan chosen by buyer that exceeds the amount allocated to seller. So I have this discussion almost weekly with agents that are writing offers that just throw a number out, right? That says, hey, you know, $700, but they don't put any kind of other kind of, of coverages or anything. Or they put coverages, but they put an amount. And I asked, did you guys check to make sure that the coverages you have are covered by that cost? Because the contract states that if we don't have the right cost in there, right? So we're asking for some special coverage and we don't have enough money, the buyer's responsible for the payment of that difference. Okay, so you have to understand that. If if you ask for an exorbitant amount but put no additional coverages, you're they're only required to give you a basic home protection policy. So understand what you're asking for, know the right 
the right amount. If buyer waives the purchase of a home warranty plan in paragraph 3Q18, buyer may still purchase a home warranty plan at buyer's expense prior to close of escrow. So if you're trying to, let's say, hey, I want to reduce the cost to the seller and or my agent has said, hey, as a gift, I'm going to pay for your, your home warranty, you could still buy one even if you put the waiver in, okay? All right. Well, I had hoped that we were going to finish. Obviously, I uh, was wrong because uh, we still got a ways to go, but I... I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that we could be done next week because we're, you know, we spend a lot of time on this. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop to share. Does anybody have any questions before I let you guys go on with your day? No? Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you being here. And I, I promise I'm going to do my best to finish next Thursday so that we can move on to something else. Um, again, I know it's important, but I do want to get through to other things for you guys. So anything else no thank you guys for being here i really really appreciate it have a great day take care see you soon mm -hmm.